and get started. We are going to be working our way through Isaiah 8, verses 16 through 22. Isaiah 8, verses 16 through 20. It's going to be a great one tonight. Isaiah 8, 16 through 22. Now, before we can move forward, we must first back up. And last week, we talked about Isaiah chapter 8, verses 5 through 15. And it's in those verses that God speaks to Isaiah through a vision. And why is he, why is he doing this? Well, what is taking place? Well, we know that King Ahaz and the Judaites have left their faith in God. They have left their faith in God. And why is that? Why have they done this? Well, it's something that happens throughout every believer's life, in a sense. You, you see this, it's cyclical, in a way. Let me put it that way. It is cyclical. You'll have a body of believers, and they become comfortable with the Lord. And you see them start to pull away from Him. And this is exactly what's taking place with the Jewish people during the time of King Ahaz. King Ahaz is no longer relying on God, and it was God who told them that he was going to be there for them. All they had to do was depend on him. There would be no foreign armies coming in to invade them. They would not have to worry about food, for he would provide for them. But King Ahaz turned from God and he went to partner up with a pagan army we know as the Assyrians. And why did he do this? Because the northern kingdom had partnered up with Syria. And we know that those two had a plan to come down and overthrow King Ahaz. So we see all of Israel rejecting God. And it's because of this that destruction is coming for them. And, and now this has been an ongoing theme as we are making our way throughout the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has been given this vision. He goes to King Ahaz. He warns King Ahaz to not turn from God, to not rely upon himself in a foreign army. But King Ahaz does not listen. So it's now... God who has promised his wrath. What is so arrogant about King Ahaz, even after Isaiah has gone to him, what is so arrogant is that King Ahaz believes that he has made the right decision by abandoning God and relying on the Assyrian army. King Ahaz feels safe about this partnership that he has made. For he is happier to hook up with the pagans than he is to trust in God. Now it's in this vision that Isaiah compares Assyria, the army, to a river that floods Judah. And we know what happens to a town when the river begins to rise. It can take over. It will destroy everything and anything in its path. And that's what God has promised. This is what is coming for King Ahaz and the Judahites. The very people that they partnered with, God is going to use them to destroy Judah. We're also given this illustration inside this vision of the Assyrians being this great river that is overtaking Judah. And, and you get this image of a person who is struggling for air. They're bobbing up and down. The water is now up to neck level. And, and just when you think that it's over for the Judahites, God's grace and mercy is going to come upon them. And there's going to be a remnant that he is going to keep. Why? Why? Because of the promise that has been made. That through the Judahites, through this land, the Messiah is coming. 
No, no matter how much mankind messes this covenant up, God's promise will always stand. But this vision doesn't just promise the destruction of the Judahites. No, this vision also tells of the destruction of the Assyrians. The very army that God uses to bring wrath upon the Judahite, God is going to destroy. And you sit here and you, you, you ponder this for a moment. Wait a minute. But, but God used the Assyrians. God ordained for the Assyrians to go in and destroy Judah. And now God is going to punish the Assyrians for what he ordained for them to do? Yes. Absolutely. Well, how does that work? The Assyrians weren't forced. They wanted to do this. They wanted to turn their backs on the very people they had partnered with. So they are going to be held responsible for their sins by way of God destroying them. We know this army, the Assyrians, were strong and powerful and vicious, that the people feared them. But it was God who gave them that power, that ferocity, that viciousness. And it's God who can take it away from them and destroy them. Isaiah 8 Verse 16, again, we're still in the vision, where it says, Bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. Now, this seems to be metaphorical, because if it's to be taken literally, then this would mean that Isaiah was keeping the word that God had given him by way of this vision, and he was going to keep it to himself. He wasn't going to allow this word to make it to the people any longer. His missionary work was done. He was leaving the public ministry. But that's not what this is saying here. Because we've already been told through the vision that Isaiah is to do what? He is to write the vision down on a large piece of wood or stone to where the people can come and read about this very vision. So this is a metaphor. And it's for those who believe in this vision, the remnant, that they will bind up this truth in their heart. Bind up the testimony. Hold it close to you in what has been revealed. Have faith in it. Trust in it. What was this telling the people? The remnant, you are to rely on God, not the person who has been placed in charge of you by the name of King Ahaz. Do not place your faith in him. Verse 17 says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. Now the house of Jacob means the nation of Israel. And Israel at this point in time has turned from God. The northern and southern kingdom have both partnered with heathen armies instead of depending on the Lord. Israel has turned from God and God has turned his face from them. And because the people have rejected them, have rejected him, God's wrath is coming for those very people. Now, now think about this. This is the Israelites. Th these peoples, their ancestors, God rescued them from slavery, brought them through the wilderness, and in doing so, he fed them all along the way, bringing them to the promised land. God never broke his promise. But the people, the Israelites, have. They rejected him. However, Isaiah and the remnant have kept their faith in God. They depended on him, not on the kings who ran 
to the pagan lands for help. Church, for a true disciple will trust in God and will wait on him. Why? Because a true disciples know that they can depend on him, the holy of holies. Church, I said this last week. We are not the Judahites, and we are not going to have a prophet like Isaiah sent to us. But we can learn from this book. We can learn because we have the complete word of God. And just as the land of Judah was being run by a king who did not want God, who did not depend on God, we must learn from this. Because now, the future leader of this country and his party are against God. The party that is coming into power does not believe that a baby is a gift from God. They see it as a clump of cells that can be torn apart in the womb. They do not believe that the word is inerrant and infallible, or else they would not say it is okay for an eight-year-old to transition into the so-called opposite sex. By them saying that, they are saying that God made a mistake creating little Johnny a boy, and that little Johnny knows better than God because he wants to be a girl. This isn't going to be popular, but I believe this is one of the reasons why we are in the situation that we are in now. You heard me speak on the Equality Act probably last Wednesday and last Sunday. It's coming, for Joe was promised within the first hundred days he was going to push it through. So I went to JoeBiden.com and printed this out. This is part of the Equality Act. Now let me say this. I don't believe that there is any reason whatsoever for a Christian to vote for the Democrats. Now listen when I say the Republicans, I'm not saying they're any better, but the one thing that they were doing was actually protecting the church, that protection is now gone. So I'll say it again. I do not know how a true Christian can vote for the Democrats, a party that is okay with killing babies, that is okay with allowing children to get on hormones to transition over to the so-called opposite sex. Here's part of the Equality Act. It's to support the freedom to build and protect families. Sounds good so far. On May 6, 2012, in a historic interview on Meet the Press, Biden became the highest ranking elected U.S. official to support marriage equality. Three years later, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed ruling that the freedom to marry is a fundamental right. Along with the freedom to marry comes the freedom to build a family. Biden believes that the LGBTQ plus people and the same-sex couples should be able to build and protect their families. Yet many government-funded foster care and adoption agencies still discriminate against LGBTQ plus families or place additional burdens on these families during the foster care or adoption process. Similarly, these agencies often put LGBTQ plus youth in care at risk by failing to place them with safe and affirming families. In November 2019, the Trump-Pence administration proposed a rule that will permit adoption and foster care, care agencies that discriminate against LGBTQ plus families to receive government funding. 
So what this is saying is that at one point in time, there were Christian organizations that were adoption agencies. And those Christian adoption agencies were not allowing same-sex couples to adopt from them. They were receiving government funding. If this takes place, those Christian agencies will no longer receive government funding, and they will no longer be able to say, look, we hold to the word of God. That is our highest authority. We do not hate the LGBTQ community. We don't. We, we do not hate them. But we cannot allow a child to be adopted by them. Does the church, do those agencies not have the right to hold to their faith? If this passes, those Christian adoption agencies will be gone. Now, there are other adoption agencies out there that an LGBTQ plus family can go to. But instead, they're going to come after the religious agencies. As President Biden will repeal the rule if implemented and work to ensure that qualified families are not discriminated against based on sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, sex, marital status, disability, or religion, and that child welfare agencies put the interests of children first, including those who are LGBTQ+. In addition, Biden will work with the U.S. Department of State and other federal agencies to ensure the equal treatment of same-sex couples and their children in the application of all federal programs, services, and benefits, especially with respect to citizenship, eligibility requirements, and immigration and naturalization proceedings. This goes directly against the word of God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think the government should have any dealings when it comes to marriage. But what is the definition of marriage, church? God gave us the definition of man and woman. Now, if the government wants to get involved and they want to have a civil union, that's on them. They can have that. We don't agree with it. And, and we tell people we don't agree with it because we love them. And because we love them, what does that mean? We want them to hear the truth. Now, we're going to be seen as hateful and as bigots. But all we want is for the truth to be told. Also part of the Equality Act, and this is what terrifies me, is the misuse of broad exemptions to discriminate. Religious freedom is a fundamental American value, but states have inappropriately used broad exemptions to allow businesses, medical providers, social service agencies, state and local government officials, and others to discriminate against LGBTQ plus people. The Trump-Pence administration has deliberately and systematically attempted to gut protections for the LGBTQ plus community by carving out broad religious exemptions to existing non-discrimination laws and policies across federal agencies. Biden will reverse Trump's policies, misusing these broad exemptions and fight so that no one is turned away from a business or refused service by a government official just because of who they are or who they love. So it's not enough that the government can tell a private business when to close or open their doors during a pandemic. But now they're going to be able to tell a private business they must serve everyone no matter their religious beliefs and or their convictions. We all remember the baker who was sued for not making a cake for a gay wedding. Does that baker not have the right 
to say no. Because there are plenty of bakers around who will bake that cake for them. Or what about a wedding photographer? Do they not have the right to say, yes, I will shoot this wedding, but no, not this one, because it goes against my religious beliefs? Church eventually is going to come down to this. A church will not be able to refuse to marry a same-sex couple. And again, it's not out of hatred. It's out of what God and his word says. It's what it states. It's a man and a woman. That is the definition of marriage, and that is what we as a church are to hold to. But if you think that's going to stand, then you're wrong. It's coming. And you know why? Because Christians don't even know what they believe. They don't even know God, these so-called Christians. I'm telling you, I don't think there's any way possible a true Christian could have voted for a Democrat. If it's out of ignorance, then that's one thing. And that Christian should repent because they don't know what it is the Democrat Party stands for. But if you do it knowingly, I question your faith. It goes on. There's another part that should probably terrify us, and I'll quit on this and head back into the book of Isaiah. The Equality Act is also going to ensure blood donation procedures that are based on science. Under the Obama-Biden administration, the discriminatory lifetime ban on blood donation based on stigma was lifted. Biden will work with the Food and Drug Administration to ensure regulations are based on science, not on fiction or stigma. As proposed by the Human Rights Campaign, Biden will invest in new research to study risky behavior and support consideration of revising the donor questionnaire so that they focus on more refined and specific behavioral criteria like recent sexual histories that include unprotected sex or significant numbers of sexual partners over the previous year. That's not based on science. That's based on trying to please everyone. There are certain groups that are at higher risk because of their sexual partners. It's almost as if common sense is gone in this post-postmodern world that we're living in now. But I blame the church. Because the church no longer stands for the truth. We no longer have men behind the pulpits claiming what the word says. We have a bunch of cowards, but not true men of God. See, they're more concerned with the pulpits being full than for the truth coming out. Because you know what the truth does today, church? It turns people away. Verse 18. Behold, back to the vision. 
I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Now Isaiah makes this personal here. When it seems as if everything is dire, Isaiah finds comfort in the disciples that God has given him. And how did God do that? He regenerated the hearts of these Judahites. And in doing so, they became disciples of Isaiah. They heard what he was saying. They believed in what he was saying. And church, they believed in a time when believing in God wasn't popular. I don't know. What about you? So the Judahites, the Judahites had turned from God and despised the ones who believed in him. So you can only imagine the hatred they had towards Isaiah. You can only imagine the hatred that was coming for the disciples as well. For the Judahites wanted nothing to do with them, that being Isaiah and the disciples. And that's evident by how few of the Judahites were actually converted. Now this seems as if it would be a time when Isaiah would be discouraged. His ministry wasn't bursting at the seams. That's because he's reformed. And the more he preached, the more people despised his message. But that didn't matter to him. He knew that he wasn't going to be popular. The only thing that he wanted to do was to please the God of hosts. That's the bottom line. If you are a true believer, the one thing that you want is to please God. And how do you do that? You hold to his commandments. You hold to his word. And is that going to make you popular? No. Today, just like then, it's going to make people hate you. And it's going to get worse. Oh, Britt, thanks for the uplifting sermon. It's not supposed to be. We are heading into a dark time. So even though God has hidden his face for a season against Israel... He's still dwelling with the remnants. He's still dwelling in Zion. And in this vision, by even saying that he's still dwelling in Zion, Isaiah is speaking out against the false believers with those very words. And who are those false believers? The Judahites who claim God but worshiped idols made by their own hands. And when they would worship their false god, they would say that they were going to the temple of the Lord. But they had rejected the word of God. And they proved it by worshiping their false idols inside of their wicked places of worship. For the Judahites' faith wasn't in God, for they had turned to evil. And the Judahites are going to ask the same of Isaiah and the disciples. I believe we can see another comparison there. We have a lot of so-called Christians today. We say they, they worship Jesus. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the third person in the Holy Trinity. But when it comes to the word, they don't follow it. They look more like the world and believe more like the world than they do the true disciples. Hence where we are today. So again, I say the Judahites' faith wasn't in God. They had turned to evil. And they're going to ask Isaiah and the disciples to do the same. Look at verse 19. Still in the vision. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, 
Should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Whereas Isaiah and the disciples continue to preach the true God, the Judahites will become angry with them. And they'll say to them, well, do we not have the rights to call on the spirits of the dead for guidance? Do we not have the right to call for the necromancers and the mediums? Why can we not go to them? At best, these necromancers and mediums, they were nothing more than ventriloquists who could throw their voice. At worst, they would be men and women who were actually demon-possessed. And this is who the Judahites went to. Not to God, but to the mediums and the necromancers. And some even chirped. Could you imagine that? You, you pay money and you, you're sitting in front of this person that sounds like a bird? Here's what's interesting. Only the necromancer knew what he was chirping, so he would have to translate it for you. That makes sense. Sounds like the church that speaks in tongues today. Isaiah cries out to the Judaites. Why are you crying out to these pagans? These pagan gods? These false teachers? Should not a people of God inquire unto him? Or was it not God who has rescued your ancestors, who has provided for you time and time again? Isaiah has to be thinking, have, have you all just gone mad? Has the world just gone crazy? Some of you being here today may feel the same way when you got up this morning. Isaiah is telling the Jewish people that they have more respect in the Gentiles' false gods than in the one true God. It's insane, isn't it? The Israelites were given the one true living God, and yet what are they focusing on? The dead. Stop right there. Church, please understand that when we speak the truth, we're not going after a certain community. And we, we love that community and we want them to hear the truth. Let me put it this way. I would be the most evil person in the room if I believe in the word of God and yet I don't tell others about it. If I believe that your soul, that your soul rests in the hands of God and that you need to hear the truth about the one who has redeemed his elect, and yet I say nothing about it? What kind of piece of garbage would I be? If to know the truth and not warn others. Again, we're going to be seen as a bunch of bigot hicks who are not going along with the world. But church, we, we can't. I pray that we learn from these verses. That we can relate to these verses. Because our only hope is in Christ.
questions, comments?